Almost three quarters of a million people live in San Francisco. They make their homes in famous neighborhoods like Alamo Square, the Castro, and Chinatown. But few San Franciscans and even fewer tourists ever see Bayview Hunters Point. This is considered a very bad neighborhood. How much assault did you see on the street today? Right, right. We got the best weather of the city. We have a lot of talent here from the city. And we have the worst pollution and the worst criminalization in the city. The Bayview and Hunters Point neighborhoods are perched on the southeast edge of San Francisco, just 10 minutes from downtown. San Francisco built its first opera house here and its first Major League Baseball park. The Navy shipped the atomic bomb from Hunters Point on its way to Japan. Bayview Hunters Point is home to more African Americans than any other neighborhood. It's nurtured the budding careers of black talents, from politicians to movie stars. There's no place like home, and I love this place with the good, the bad, the ugly, or whatever, you know, and it means so much to me in that regard, so this is where I grew up. It's a mixture of contrasts, sweeping views of the city and the bay, and a host of social, environmental, and economic tensions. Cops, if you don't like the cops, put your hands up. If you don't like the cops, put your hands up. Asthma is out of control here and breast cancer rates among women under 40 are the highest in the country. Despite its problems, Bayview Hunters Point is one of the last areas in San Francisco where housing is still affordable. And today, after decades of neglect, redevelopment is underway. Will progress destroy San Francisco's last black neighborhood? wake of the California gold rush, two brothers, dairymen and land speculators, arrived in San Francisco. The Hunter brothers sold acres of land on a hill that came to be known as Hunter's Point. Bayview Hunter's Point really was undeveloped until the 1920s, other than a few farms. Uh, they started building up Bayview, which is much flatter, uh, during the 1920s, and uh, a lot of single-family homes. Uh, it was an Italian, Maltese, French, white ethnic community. Hunter's Point itself uh, remained largely undeveloped uh, until the 1940s, uh, in large part because there's this large ridge there, which is called uh, the Hill. With the approach of World War II, the Navy shipyard on the edge of the hill drew workers from across the country, including thousands of African Americans. After the war, they kept coming. And I just fell in love with San Francisco, and the uh, first opportunity I got, boom, I came on out here. Willie Ratcliffe came from Texas in 1950. I even worked at the shipyard in 1951. I started off as a rigger helper. And where did you live, though, when you were out here? Fillmore. That's where most of the black people live. At that time. Today, he and his wife live in this two bedroom house at 3rd and Palou, the business heart of Baby Hunters Point. In it, they publish a local newspaper. Their living room window gives a bird's eye view of the area, which in the 1950s was an industrial zone. Oh, they had a slaughterhouse and a meat packing area. They killed cattle. They had cattle down there when I came out here. The stench was terrible. Up on Hunter's Point, the federal government had built housing for its new workers, many of whom were white. You have lots of temporary housing that's been put up, barrack-style housing uh, that's been put up, you know, sort of overnight with not a lot of materials because they're not really expecting these to last too long. It's just, you know, these are five-year buildings. On the Navy base and in these barrack-style houses, a city within the hill was formed. There's a wash house, I think there's a bar, there's a police station. It's its own little community. And 3rd Street really becomes the commercial hub of the area. It's an interracial community. There are blacks there. Not a lot, but a good chunk. They had some 22,000 people working out at the shipyard. And uh, about 10,000 of them was from this community. 
So this is really what kept uh, uh, the African American community going. When the war ended, so did the jobs, and the welcome to black workers withered. But once the war was over, hey, go back to where you come from or whatever you were doing, and that's what they wanted blacks to do. And matter of fact, uh, they asked uh, one of the black newspapers here, well, so the war's over now, is blacks gonna go back south? And uh, they asked him, was the Golden Gate Bridge gonna disappear? So I said, blacks are here to stay. But where were they going to stay? It was difficult for African Americans to find housing. Because they had a law here in San Francisco. Most of uh, the property was uh, set up where blacks couldn't buy. That's how segregated and uh, bad it was here in San Francisco. So uh, they didn't want blacks out here, period. It was too good for them. As a result, many landed in public housing. The housing authority would shuttle them in certain areas, and then renters would not rent to them, or sell, buyers or sellers would not sell to them. By mid-1950s, San Francisco's housing authority took control of the federal land and its so-called temporary housing, and built more housing projects on the hill. By the agency's design, most black families ended up on Hunter's Point, and later in Bayview. And this is really when it beco starts becoming a, an exclusively black community on the hill. Uh, because of the housing authority. I guess in 1950, the hill is 43% black, and in 1960, it was 75, and then in 1968, it was about 97% black. Mother had a job, and dad had a job, and we all lived there, but we were happy. We didn't have much, but we had each other. Community leader, Reverend Cordell Hawkins, works with the DA's office. He recalls his years in the housing project everything. that was originally used as Navy barracks. Today, there's a street named for his family. At that time, I was the last child. I was the seventh child. And there's actually 10 of us. And then the other three came after we moved there. The increasing population spilled down the hill into the Bayview area's single family houses. And of course, as they moved in, now I tell you, they start selling out. So they just bought up the whole neighborhood and the highest home ownership in this city is out here by far, not just a few points above, but uh, every black had an opportunity out there and bought a house if you had a job. Blacks seized the opportunity to buy their own homes even though businesses left. You do have more commercial flight from the area. Businesses, especially on the hill, the hill at the end just has a liquor store probably racism has something to do with this, but a lot of it was that they couldn't insure themselves anymore. Right? Once it became a black community, it was really hard to insure themselves. At the same time, another black community in San Francisco was being torn apart. The vibrant working class neighborhood, the Fillmore, became a victim of urban renewal in the late 50s, early 60s. Many blacks were forced out. Nothing. And this is, I'm just about to flip. Please believe me. They're going to come through and they don't, if they even ask you, what were you willing to accept? They don't even do that. They come and put the price to you and then you got to accept it. I don't approve of that. Now, I don't intend to go to the Bay. I've lived here all of my life. I've worked here. I've sweated. And I'm still working, even though I'm in a wheelchair and I don't know how much longer I'll be here. But nevertheless, I, I have no intention, and if a bulldozer come down my way, baby, I'll be there in this wheelchair, and he'll have a hell of a good time. <laughs> but Fillmore Blacks did relocate to Bayview Hunters Point and eventually turned it into home. All of, all of our girlfriends, all of the ones that you see here now, tonight, that were here all night, we grew up with, were here. Almost every day, we all hung together, and we always went somewhere together, and we always had fun. We always had fun. 
the Sanders family moved to Bayview Hunters Point in the 50s after leaving the Fillmore. They've raised generations in this house, and tonight at a birthday party for Denise, dozens have traveled back to the Bayview for a little fun. Most everybody here is from Bayview Hunters Point, and some of my friends that I grew up with, all of us are still right here, and all of our kids are friends, so we see each other a lot. It's changed just a little bit, but it's still almost the same. All the neighbors are still here. They're just a little older. Bayview was never fancy, but it became the center of black life in San Francisco. Practically every African American from the Bay Area has some connection to the Bayview. Denise's brother, Melvin Sanders, is a Muni bus driver. The graphics of the community is changing in a sense, you know. Um, people are growing with it. Some people have moved out, but I think they still do come back and stay in touch with the community because they have, uh, you know, a lot of strong ties. But back in 1966, when many inner cities were in turmoil, a violent outbreak threatened the spirit of Baby Hunters Point. On September 27th, 16-year-old Matthew Johnson stole a car with friends. They spotted a police officer. So they, they stop their car in the middle of the street and they run off in three different directions. The cop understands that something's up, right? So he runs, he picks Matthew to run after. Chased him all the way down third, down Palouse Street, down towards the shipyard. And he got down there, because down there was a fence to enter the shipyard. When we was chased by police back in those days, and we they chased us up on the hill, we lost them because they didn't know the hill like we did. The chase took a tragic turn when the officer pulled his gun. He said he called out for Matthew Johnson to stop, but then lowered his gun and shot the 16-year-old boy in the back. Well, we felt as though that was unjust. Shouldn't have killed him. That wasn't no grounds to kill him. Their life wasn't be, you know, wasn't threatened. So we start rioting, tearing up the whole community. And I was 16 years old. I'll never forget that day. People demanded that the mayor come to the area. The mayor did not come. And then, then at that point, things started getting out of hand. It scared the hell out of them, and uh, of course the mayor uh, called the National Guard in here. The arrival of 1,200 armed National Guardsmen changed the tone. It was no longer a protest of police brutality, it was a race riot. National Guard came in and they camped out in, at uh, Candlestick Park. And then all of a sudden one day we were down hanging out, and they come marching down 3rd Street and to 3rd and Newcomb, and they started shooting at us. So we running all over the place, running from the bullets and everything. Well, we shooting back, too, because we had our little zip guns. And we would run inside the opera house, and they would shoot up the opera house. Shoot, they shot up the man's car that is across the street from the opera house, that in house. I'll never forget, he had holes all in his car. Over six days, 359 people were arrested and 51 injured. Order was restored, but political and economic fallout would haunt Baby Hunters Point for years to come. Tanks and bayonets and, you know, right under, just scared the hell out of the community. But this community used to be tough. It's getting that way again. But, uh, you know, they used to vote 100%. But after those tanks and after that ride, it just scared them into submission and they ain't had the courage to get back up yet. No, we have not recovered uh, from 66 to rise because you have a lot of vacant buildings in the community that has not been open, that's been boarded up and has not been uh, open since. In Bayview Hunters Point, about 90% of the population is people of color. Unemployment is more than twice as high as the rest of the city. And there are about four times as many hazardous waste sites here than in any other part of San Francisco. 
children just suffer from health issues and the adults or young adults suffer from policing issues and you know there's no stores there's no grocery stores and just all of these issues that exist in other communities of color are just exemplified here just to extreme degrees the children in this area it's a high concentration of asthma the contract in asthma why how we don't know cancer breast cancer where's that coming from there are many contributing factors to the health problems here an organization, Literacy for Environmental Justice, conducts a 45-minute toxic tour in the area to inform people of the hazards. The power plant was built in 1929, and it's probably the largest stationary contributor to asthma in the area. The tour begins at the Navy shipyard, which closed in 1974. The EPA has placed it on its national priorities list, citing numerous dangerous toxins within. The cleanup has been going on for years, but problems still persist. In 2000, a long-burning toxic fire sparked outrage from Bayview residents. Do you want a house next to a 46-acre landfill that got radioactive in it, PCBs, and you name it in it? That's on fire! Man, who run it? You ain't murdering no more kids! Man, who run it? Another issue that won't go away? Conflict with the police and protests against them. On this afternoon, activists toured the neighborhood, calling for police reform. Many young people here feel targeted by police, and police brutality claims the lives of numerous Baby Hunters Point residents year after year. When they see a black man, they don't automatically think they can just brutalize him with no consequence. Sandra Juanita started the Idris Deli Foundation to help victims and families of victims of police brutality. Police shot 23-year-old Idris Deli numerous times after his girlfriend called to get psychiatric help for him. His mother, Misha Irizari, co-founder of the group, works in his memory to make police accountable for their actions. When we hit their pocket and they don't get a two-week pay vacation for murdering someone, but they are suspended with no pay, we might see some more appliance to policies and procedures. When something happened to somebody in the hood, we can't just be like, damn, that's their family. That's our family. That's our hood. That's our community. After this rally, San Francisco voters passed a police reform measure to increase supervision of the police. It also gave more power to the Office of Citizen Complaints. When you have a high concentration or a high percentage of unemployment, a lot of things stems from that. A lot of problems stems from that. When there are no jobs, you see a lot of the youth working in the corners because there are kids raising kids. They need to feed their family. If we get in the position where we consolidate black ownership, we create jobs in Bayview Hunters Point, those kids might give it a second chance. Of course, it's not going to be $500 in their pocket every day, but they might live to be 18, to be 20, or even to be 30 and 40. Feeling shut out of the city's political system, black Bayview residents jumped at the chance in 1996 to vote for Willie Brown as San Francisco's first black mayor. But the support they hoped to get didn't materialize, according to publisher Willie Ratcliffe. He didn't give it on. None of the projects that went on here in San Francisco, Willie Brown hired a few of the, what they call the uh, uh, talented 10th as long as they went along with his program and kept their mouth shut. All the people that got killed out here, Willie Brown has never publicly opened his mouth. And I see that as almost unforgivable. Not everyone concerned with Bayview Hunters Point issues agrees that the Brown administration was a failure in the area. But many, including Willie, are hopeful that the new mayor will do better. And then they had to get a white boy come in there. Now they want to criticize him because he at least come out here where they're doing to the kill it. So far, San Francisco's new mayor, Gavin Newsom, has begun to interact with the community. And this is a, an area where I want to prioritize our efforts. We're not going to solve problems overnight. We're not going to solve them in one term. I recognize that, but I want to start with some renewed energy and renewed vigor. While the mayor is making his rounds on Hunter's Point, other city offices are working on a redevelopment plan.
Third Street is the gateway to Bayview Hunters Point. It also connects downtown San Francisco with the neighborhood. With the thoroughfare under heavy construction, it's hard to miss that a change is coming. After voters passed a tax measure to pay for the construction, Muni began building a light rail service along 3rd Street from downtown. For the longest time, folks have talked about trying to improve 3rd Street, make it a neighborhood serving commercial corridor as it apparently used to be back in the 50s and 60s. Um, so that's, that's the, the hope. There are competing visions of what should be done in the neighborhood along the new Muni line. Committees like this one, known as the PAC, or the Bayview Hunters Point Project Area Committee, meet regularly and work closely with the redevelopment agency. People have spoken about a decent restaurant, they have spoken about recreational facilities. They have spoken about uh, shoe repair, shoe services, uh, grocery, um, all of those kinds of things. PAC member Reverend Hawkins says there's even more. They're going to add on to the Opera House, as well as redoing the Joseph Lee Gym. Uh, Home Depot is coming. And that's another project which is down on Bayshore. The final development plan is expected to be completed by the end of 2004, subject to approval by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Well, you know, the government bears watching, because they're nothing but a bunch of uh, uh, people that uh, want power and money, and they kind of go together. And the rest of us are just counting for as long as they, we let them get away with it. This sentiment stems from memories of redevelopment of the Fillmore that displaced so many blacks. But Cheryl Towns, who's lived in Bayview for 27 years, says this time it will be different. No, we will not do that. And that is not something to be uh, fearful of at this point in time. In the 60s, it happened in San Francisco. But that was urban renewal, so to speak, which is a different animal than what redevelopment is today. Even with the distrust of the agency, most residents, especially homeowners, favor the redevelopment. I think it's going to bring growth and profits to the community. I think it's going to bring a lot of that. Sure, it's good. If it's going to be good for white folks, it's good for us. But many who don't own their homes are worried. As the area develops, rents may go up. The costs of buying a home have already increased. Oh, I'm a painter. I have a trade, but I don't have enough money to buy no house over here. You know what I'm saying? And the houses in this neighborhood, man, in the last, like, five years, and they went from like 250000 to 500000 It'll last like five years. You can go up to the top of that hill and you can look at the view, man. You know, it's beautiful. I don't know how much it pitches these guys that come out the projects, pay, you know, to the view. But I mean, man, it's gorgeous. You think they don't want that? They willing to pay for it. And if you ain't, then you got to go. And it's disgusting. And some may have to go. The Housing Authority is proposing to demolish and rebuild this project. If they do, occupants will likely be relocated to public housing out of the area. People that's buying homes in this area are not blacks. They're other nationalities. They're, they're Asian or they're Hispanic. That's what's buying in the area. The, the blacks are moving out of the area. The blacks are moving to Concord, Antioch, Sacramento, Pittsburgh, Fairfield. They're not, they're not buying in, in the Bayview. Everyone that's buying here are of another uh, descent. So if they continue to buy in other areas and no one comes into the area, guess what? We're going to have zero black population. That's all it's doing. Although Cheryl Towns says the redevelopment agency will do all it can to create affordable housing, Towns is also a realist. But the marketplace is taking over San Francisco. Given our employment and educational situation, 
the market is not the most friendly for African Americans right now in this city. If you need to be afraid of something, you need to be afraid of uh, <laughs> being poorly educated and underemployed in this, uh, in this economy, in this city. I think that Bayview Hunters Point has the ability to be a wonderful community, but I think unfortunately there's going to be um, gentrification that happens here, and so probably when it becomes a wonderful community, the people that live here now won't benefit from that. This resilient community has survived much over the years. It deserves to have a place in San Francisco, but residents will have to be proactive in making sure that they're included in the new Bayview Hunters Point. It's just like playing basketball team. You don't work together, what you get, you get you butt beat, <laughs> you know. And the same thing with black people. If we don't work together to stand up and take what we have, put it together, now all of the money to be made out here and make it be made by people that don't live here. So it's incumbent on us to wake up.